All of a sudden, probably just, just oh. overload of oxygen or not enough. <coughs> it was just Woo. Call it everything got colorful, and then I didn't get the probably not out. enough. If your brain's oxygen deprived, you start seeing a lot of colors. I started or seeing colors. Or you could get a notebook out of the right side. It was like of the pixelated buffet. color. Where did it hit? It was a Sherry's uh, house. Just in the uh, in one of my fingers. We were Sherry's like, house. Yeah. 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 I felt it. One of the, in that little downstairs bathroom. Yeah. Over there that's it wasn't the, it was the main floor bathroom. A main floor bathroom, but yeah. it wasn't the main bathroom. It was the one right by the entrance of the door. It's 10:31. I almost passed out. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, we can talk about that during lunch. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Recording is stuck. Watch people pass out. <laughs> Holy rollers, they call them. Yeah. Well, good to see everybody here, and everybody's looking kind of festive and in the holiday spirit. I mean, it looks like mm -hmm. the red, bright green. colors, and <laughs> kind of cheery and all that. Bright colors. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> for what? We got Kenny and Kenny. 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 Oh, I got my fancy cover. Fancy cover there. <laughs> I'm sitting with my slick belt. Slick belt. It's also black. <laughs> okay, we're good to have everybody, of course. It's uh, like a always great <laughs> to uh, meet together. This is what we do every uh, Sabbath. And, uh, of course, we encourage uh, other folks to do the same. And uh, kind of ahead of the curve a little bit. We know that eventually... Uh, many, if not all, of God's people will be in a scenario like this. <coughs> and so you need to work, be working toward this kind of a, a situation anyway. But before we, tea, before we have our story, we always have an inspirational story that uh, Rose does mostly. <coughs> before we do that, we want to uh, open with prayer. So let me <coughs> just invite you to bow your heads. <coughs> Father, once again, we want to thank you so much for watching over us through another week. Uh, we only survive uh, day after day because of your faithfulness. Um, what can we say? Uh, how can we thank you for all that you do for us? Uh, we do want to praise you for who you are. You are the sovereign of the universe. Nothing happens uh, without your approval. Uh, you control uh, everything, and we're asking the Lord, that you would particularly can control our lives. We, we want to be in tune with you. We want to be in harmony with you. We want you to direct our steps. We want you to use us in a very decided way in the finishing of your great work. And so we pray, Lord, that your spirit will come today and uh, encourage us, instruct us, teach us, guide and direct us. Uh, we need your insight. We need understanding and perspective. And so we're praying, Lord, that you'll accomplish that today. Thank you for uh, everyone here, for those who tune in and watch uh, around the world, uh, either live or afterwards. And we pray that we will inspire someone today to uh, draw closer to you. So thank you for using us in this way. And we do <clears throat> thank you for all these uh, wonderful miracles. And we ask these things in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen and amen. 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 <coughs> Okay, so it's uh, <coughs> Mama's up for chapter, chapter seven time. This is called Spirits in Action. It's going to be an interesting chapter. About two or three weeks after visiting the worship room, I had another opportunity to converse with the high priest about Satan and his angels. I mentioned to him about my expecting to meet a group of tough-looking characters before I attended my first meeting with them. He smiled, chuckled a little, and said, Spirit worshippers, like any members of society, vary in mentality, in likes and dislikes and so on. Depending on the national culture of a people to a great extent, it depends on the spirits leading. In times to come, as you travel the globe, you will notice that among people where illiteracy is high, superstition prevails, and then the most degrading forms of worship are employed. The spirits in such cases take pleasure in leading people that way, because they know that it hurts their great rival Christ, who has claimed that if he be lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men to himself. They have proven him wrong century after century, and they find delight in doing so. Millions upon millions have gone to the grave without so much as having heard his name, much less believing in him. While the priest was explaining about the intensity of demon spirits working in the lives of humans, I could tell that his emotions were becoming involved greatly in what he was saying. 
He got up from his desk chair and began pacing the floor as he talked. He folded his hands behind his back and kept looking at the floor as he went back and forth, occasionally looking up at me. The words mentioned here I recall clearly because of the great impact they made upon my mind. He continued, as for us here in Montreal, we find ourselves in a way at the brighter end of the spectrum. Every one of us by nature has inve was invested with mental faculties far above that of the millions inhabiting this great island. No arrogance there. That is why the Master has gone out of his way to acquaint us with the reality of things in the spirit world. He has a special work for each one of us to do. Don't stop looking at me as if you don't believe me. I was shocked by what he had said up to then, and undoubtedly it was shown on my face. And I immediately replied, Sir, pardon me if I have offended you by anything I have said or done. I do believe what you have said. I have much to learn in acquainting myself with the Master's will, and all I have witnessed here in your house of worship is so new and different from what I was brought up to believe. He then picked up the conversation by saying, I didn't mean to snap at you, believe me, and you have not offended me. It's just at times I take things probably too seriously. I was not boasting in the way I talked about our people here in Montreal. That was told to me by the Master personally. By then the old guy was back in his desk chair, had lit a cigar, and was puffing away. He went on saying, concerning you and your friend Roland, it was revealed to me a year ago that I would meet you here in our house of worship, but I had forgotten about it. And as I have mentioned to you a while back, I was relaxing in a hotel suite in Chicago when a chief counselor appeared to me, refreshed my memory pertaining to you, and told me to get on the phone immediately to the person I had left in charge while I was away. He was about to wreck all the work the spirits had done to put you in touch with us. I telephoned the man at once, and before I had time to say anything, he mentioned that George had asked for the permission to have you and your friend attend a praise session. Boy, it's so hard to use these terms and the demonic at the end of things. And of course, I that um, he had refused him the privilege of attending. And of course, I informed him of the chief counselor's wishes. So I called George to tell him it would be a pleasure to have you with us. As you can see, the master thinks a great deal of each one of us, so don't underestimate yourself. And after returning to my residence that evening, I experienced an almost sleepless night as my conversation with the priest kept presenting to my mind. I didn't understand at the time what had prompted the satanic priest to burst out the words, stop looking at me as if you don't believe me, and the thought of it all consumed my sleep time. Even though I had reached a place in my life where I had very few feelings for anyone in suffering or distress and had no use for God, I could see the spirit of the living God had not given up on me. And somehow, as the priest mentioned the demon spirits working at degrading humans in order to hurt Christ, suddenly I felt sorry for Christ. I felt a stirring up of emotions in the depths of my heart, such as I had not felt since I was about 12 years old. As I've mentioned in a previous chapter, after our mother passed away, my younger brother Edgar and I went to a boarding academy operated by nuns. It was a lovely place to be and everyone was kind except for one person. One of the older boys was picking on my little brother every now and then, even though the nuns tried to put a stop to it. One day I found my brother on his bed in the dormitory sobbing away. As I questioned him about his sorrow, he said, I wish our mother was still alive. I'm very unhappy here. You see, if Mother were alive, I wouldn't have to put up with this one boy making my life unhappy. I told Edgar, I will take care of things so he will not trouble you again. My brother's words had stirred up emotions in my heart over his distress that prompted me to take a course of action that could have brought me a severe punishment. I decided to beat the fellow up, even though he was bigger than I was. It was winter time, and most everyone was outdoors, ice skating or enjoying some form of winter activity. I went out, spotted the boy on the skating rink, went up to the gate and called him to come over. He complied and as he reached me, I immediately picked up a hockey stick that was nearby, hit the ice with a force sufficient to break it in two and proceeded to let him have a bit of what I felt was the right medicine. Fortunately, I was restrained by others or I would have injured him severely. Concerning the feelings I had experienced when the satanic priest talked about evil angels degrading human beings in order to hurt Christ, Deep in my heart, I felt that same indignation arising within me that I experienced years ago on my brother's behalf. My face must have reflected a sentiment that momentarily was felt but not interpreted correctly by the satanic priest. 
I thank the Lord that he was not able to read my mind or I would have been in great trouble. One particular evening, my friend Roland had to work overtime at his job and was unable to reach me before I left for the meeting. As he was riding the streetcar going home, he figured that if he went directly to the meeting place, he probably wouldn't be very late anyway. So he then decided to transfer at the intersection of St. Catherine Street and St. Laurent Boulevard, and while making the transfer, gave me a call at the house of worship. But one thing was lacking, the phone number. He had left it at home. If only he could remember the address. That's the numerals on the house. He could then get the phone number from the operator. In those days, one could get that kind of service from the phone company in Montreal. So he took a small notebook he had in his pocket, pulled out his pen to write, but try as he might, he could not visualize the numbers he had seen so many times on the building. But to his great surprise, as he whispered to himself, I wish the spirits would help me, some invisible hand moved the pen with his hand still on it, writing not only the house number, but the name of the street in beautiful script. He felt quite delighted over this accomplishment until the operator told him she was sorry. She could not help him. That number was unlisted. And about that time, George and I wondered what had happened to our friend, and George got an idea. Let us help in solving our problem by asking Gerard, the clairvoyant, to locate Roland. After a few words and incantation, Gerard closed his eyes, placed his fingers on his temples, and said, I see Roland having just entered a United Cigar store at the corner of St. Catherine and St. Laurent Boulevards. He is now talking to the telephone operator. He wants our phone number, but is being told that it is unlisted. I will, by the help of my familiar spirit, transfer a thought to him by mental telepathy. He has it. He's all set now, and he is dialing. George, be ready to answer. He'll be asking for you. George started walking to the phone across the room, and on the first ring, someone picked up the receiver, and after saying, hello, said, George, it's for you. When Roland arrived, he was delighted over his experience with the spirits. He showed us that beautiful writing on the paper and said, I'm going to frame this piece of paper. I have never seen such beautiful freehand writing in my life. Then turning to the priest, he asked this question. I wonder why the spirit didn't give me the phone number as well as the address. The satanic priest spoke up saying, you didn't ask for it. <laughs> According to thy faith, be it done unto thee. Listen to that, even almost quoting scripture. I hate this. <laughs> he then continued in these words, the experience you had this evening is child's play in comparison to what the gods have in mind for you two. But you have to exercise faith in the spirits and expect great things from them. What is needed in your life is to witness the spirit's power and intelligence at work a few times. Then I believe you will be able to exercise a sufficient amount of faith so they will work for you in great ways. It must have been two or three weeks later, as we entered that lovely residence, that the satanic priest greeted us adding, this evening you folks are going to witness a very interesting seance. An old acquaintance of mine is visiting our city, a fine gentleman, a great professor in ancient history, historian in the fullest sense of the word. He's been affiliated with the, some of the great French universities, and his abundant knowledge of fascinating details of history has made him outstanding in his field. Or should I say the spirits have made him great, for they have supplied him with knowledge of the unknown pertaining to ancient history. This evening he will, by the way of a trance medium, uncover through the help of the spirits many unknown details pertaining to Napoleon Bonaparte's war campaigns. He is at present having his devotions in the worship room. Meanwhile, let me explain what is going to take place. We proceeded to the sitting area, made ourselves comfortable, and attentively listened to the priest, set forth of the details of what should be a most fascinating seance. A trance medium agrees to have a spirit enter their body, taking full control of their physical and mental faculties so as to be used as a means for spirits to better communicate with humans. In such a session as will be taking place this evening, it has happened in times past that as many as six to twelve different spirits have entered the trance medium's body at different times, depending on the demands placed upon them. In a certain case, one particular spirit may be very knowledgeable about certain details on some points of history, but lacking knowledge of other details. In such a case, the spirit will refer to some other spirit taking his place, which happens to be very knowledgeable on that subject, having been present and involved with the events at that time. In fact, the spirits are so precise in information that they give that in a case where a human once made a speech or any type of verbal dissertation, 
the spirit is able to reproduce not only the words spoken, but the very tones and voice qualities of the person who did the speaking. That tells you a whole lot about what goes on in the, the other realms of, of life. It's we conversed with the priest a few minutes. I beg your pardon? That's such a hard to believe. And it's interesting that they use terms that we would consider mm -hmm. using as Christians, mm -hmm. and they use them in regard to Satan the same way we would use them in regard to Jesus. I mean, that's what the devil wants. It is. Exactly. He wants to be God. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the, the guy in the white hat. The master. Yeah. So we conversed a with the priest for a few minutes, after which he let us go and she, he left us to go and check if his friend was done with his devotions. It wasn't long before he returned to tell us that all who were interested in witnessing the seance should go down to the worship room. He introduced the visiting historian to the assembly and asked for six volunteers to come forward, one of which would be chosen by the spirits as their preferred channel of communication for the evening. The six individuals stood before the priest who invoked the gods to manifest their great powers to us by having the spirits who were instrumental in directing and assisting Napoleon the Emperor of France in his military campaigns to reveal details of history when questioned by the historian present. A short ritual was performed by the priest, and while he was doing so, a spirit entered the body of one of the men and began to talk. The voice had a tone that commanded attention. The accent was that of a Parisian Frenchman. The spirit informed us that he was chief counselor, specializing in military undertakings jurisdiction over legions of spirits, and seeing that the subject being considered was very complex, two others of the remaining five men would be needed as channels of communication for the spirits. No sooner said than it was done. We saw two of the individuals kind of shivered a bit, their eyes closed, and the spirits suggested they be addressed as Remy and Alphonse. The eyes of the man possessed by the chief counselor remained opened, but never moved, nor did his eyelids blink for a period of about 45 minutes. The priest turned to the historian and said, the gods are honoring your requests. He stood up holding a clipboard and pen, and his first words were of a type to flatter the spirits by acknowledging that they had in times past given him information that made him one of the greatest in his field of learning. He conversed with the spirits for a few minutes, addressing them as Lord Remy, Lord Alphonse, and Lord Counselor. Question after question was asked, and without hesitation, the answers were given. At one point, reference was made to a certain conversation between Napoleon and one of his commanding officers. The chief counselor stated it would be preferable for Alphonse and Remy to reproduce the dialogue that took place between the two men for the sake of accuracy. It was amazing to observe. Their voices changed completely, as if it were two totally different individuals talking. I turned to George and said, this is fantastic. What a revelation. George smiled and said, if you find this impressive, wait until you hear the spirits reproduce the voices of people you have known and have been dead a long time. That really blows one's mind. The historian, having had all his questions answered regarding Napoleon Bonaparte's war exploits, informed the chief counselor that he needed additional information concerning a speech that had been made on the steps of the Montreal City Hall by the former mayor, Camille Hu, just before Canada entered World War II. The chief counselor made the commitment comment that he himself and his aides were unable to help here because all their activities were carried out in Europe. But after their departure, another counselor would take his place and inform him on what he wanted to know. Again, the men's bodies shivered, their eyes opened, and in their own voices, they asked how long they had been instrumental in the spirit's communications. As for the man occupied by the chief counselor, he shook a little, his eyes closed and opened again, and another spirit said, it is my pleasure to assist you in revealing the unknown. I was present on such a date of such a year when the mayor made a speech against the conscription of French Canadians into the armed forces. What would you like to know? The historian again stated his appreciation to the chief counselor for the continual guidance of the spirits in his life. And he continued, Due to the fact that no one was present that could make a shorthand writing of the mayor's speech, how many different, many different versions were given by people of what the mayor had said. Noble counselor, can you clear up this matter for us? I am glad to give you a word-for-word -word reproduction of his speech, said the spirit. Now this is where I was amazed beyond my ability to explain. I could hardly believe my ears. There it was, a voice I was well acquainted with, 
for I had heard it over the radio probably a hundred times over in a number of years. Chameleon Hood was a very controversial individual as a politician. He had no hesitation in voicing his opinions regarding anyone or anything. In the late 30s, Hood was hot stuff for the French news media. All of his activities as mayor of Montreal were continually in the news. His speeches and comments were recorded and replayed over and over on the radio, so his voice was easy to recognize. And now that familiar voice was being heard again, but this time reproduced through the agency of a demon spirit, and, I, and we listened to it for about 20 minutes. What a startling experience that was for me to witness. Some time ago, I was telling this experience to someone, and the individual made the statement that it could have been the departed spirit or soul of Hood giving the speech. I have news for anyone with this viewpoint. At that time, Hood was alive and well. <laughs> According to the records of the archives of the city of Montreal, he was born in August of 1889 and died on the 11th of September 1958, like the demon spirit had said. It was a reproduction of his voice and words. How spirits do it remains a mystery to me, but they do. And that evening, as we were driving home, George stated his belief that when a person dies, he or she is completely dead. And when people claim to hold communications with the spirits of the dead, they are being fooled by demon spirits impersonating their departed loved ones. At that time, I found his statement interesting, but didn't give it a great deal of thought, because George didn't want to enlarge upon it but instead mentioned we should have the priest explain the matter to us when time permitted. And it so happened that on the following Sunday evening, we were able to converse with the priest on that topic. He gave Roland and me an interesting account of demon spirits impersonating the dead. He kept illustrating the cleverness and wisdom exercised by demon spirits in their work of misleading humans. I got the impression that the man experienced great delight, some kind of devilish satisfaction at recounting particular instances when great leaders were taken for a ride of deception by demon spirits. The priest also made reference to three or four biblical accounts, but my having had no knowledge of the Bible at that time, it did not impress me, except when he mentioned as a masterpiece of deception the experience of Saul, the king of Israel, and the witch of Endor. He stated how the spirits had led Saul to rule his life by, had to, by listening to his feelings instead of the word of his God and how they completely separated him from the Creator by causing him to commit what was considered a great abomination in the sight of the God of the Hebrews, and by that means actually accomplished his own destruction. He added in these words, No greater glory could our Master bring to himself at that time in history than to lead the chief executive of the nation of Israel to bow himself before a demon spirit in the sight of all the inhabitants of the galaxies. A few months later, the words he had spoken to Roland and I were a major factor in my deciding to break away from demon worship by the grace of the Lord Jesus and accept and believe the word of God in its entirety. That's the end of chapter 7. Okay. Well, that just tells you, you better know what this Bible says. Yeah. You do, yeah. You need to know the real word. Yeah, you can tell that... Um, and understand maybe a little bit better why there is a great appeal for folks to go in that direction, particularly if they don't, if they're not familiar with Scripture, where Scripture warns against, you know, become uh, getting involved with familiar spirits and so forth. Mm -hmm. But but what's the great appeal that, that really attracts people to this kind of thing? Power. Okay, power. I think it's also insight, you know, I mean, the fact that you can ask these beings about things that happened in history, whether it's actually accurate or not, it still was interesting to me nonetheless that they were getting information about conversations that Napoleon had, you know, that maybe no one else could have possibly known or written down or, you know. Right, so it's like tapping into a, a, a <coughs> real channel of history. A living and, record. A record, right. And but not only that, it's... You know, where, where you find the elite becoming drawn to this kind of thing is because the elite are interested in taking advantage of the masses. And so if you are able to dial somebody up in your head just for the asking, if you're able to communicate, send a message per se, uh, something that you need, something that you want, something that's going to give you an advantage over somebody else or even a group of people, 
then yeah, this is this is great, right? You you have this advantage. It's like cheating for real life. It's it's yeah. I mean, it's a, it's again, it's taking advantage of things uh, very much so. And so you can see the appeal for it. Uh, and then once you get, once you are manipulated into moving in that direction, it becomes kind of addictive. And it, it's like a web or a snare that you get drawn into. And for many people, extremely difficult to tear away from. Yeah, and just thinking of, um, you know, when he was talking about not knowing how they reproduce voices of people, sure. you know, just thinking of the description of, uh, of Satan having these, like, special pipes, so to speak, like musical instruments in his body. Embedded, yeah. You know, you've got all these different possible tones and pitches you can strike with, you know, a bunch of different instruments, so maybe there's something about the angelic vocal cords that allow them to strike different chords and tones and frequencies that can mimic, kind of parrot. Yeah, well, not only sound, but but also appearance too. They can uh, look just manipulate. Like, sound just like. They can sound like. They can look like. And again, all in an effort to try to deceive people, right? It's it's really what it is. Um, scripture tells one story. The enemy is intent on trying to tell a counterfeit story, in, in an effort to deceive people. The, the the devil doesn't want you to know the truth. This book is the truth, right? He doesn't want you to know the truth, because what does the truth do? Sets you free. It sets you free, <laughs> right? And so he doesn't want a free society. Yeah. That's why we see all the things in society today that that regulate and, and control and suppress people's freedoms to, to do and to be. And uh, um, I mean, if we if the curtain were drawn back and we could you really see you know the events and the and the, uh, the the players that are pulling the strings and causing things to happen trying to take all society down a certain direction we would be absolutely amazed at the uh, complexity and the magnanimity of it it's, it's uh, uh, almost overwhelming in fact what does scripture tell us that if it were possible even the very elect would be sucked into it. Okay, so that that should really, uh, in a in a marked manner, that that should really get our attention, because there is only one resource that we can rely on that will keep us safe from what the world is entrenched in, and of course that's the scriptures. Yeah, but yet good. how lightly? I mean how. I mean, we take it for granted, don't we? Mm -hmm. The book sits there all week long. Are, are we hungering and thirsting after what's in this book? Maybe we used to. That was the Ephesus experience, right? That was the... Uh, we, were, we were permitted at some point to be able to look upon words of truth. Just think about that. We were, we were permitted to be able to do that. To uh, gain a picture of what was what was real and correct, uh, and that became, of course, very desirable, and we were very passionate about it in our church in our in our early Christian experience, and that led to conversion, meaning a, a change, a transformation. You know, uh, it wasn't the old that was, um, it wasn't the old nature renovated, it was an entirely new nature that you received, that we received, right? An entirely new nature. But the old man, according to scripture, is still there, uh, always trying to rear <coughs> its ugly head, to take back that control. What does a constant endeavoring in the word do? It just simply suppresses, it continually suppresses that, that old man, right? And you're walking in the spirit, you're walking in newness of life. That kind of thing. So for a Christian, for anybody that becomes converted, now you have two natures kind of vying for control, vying for the mastery. You know, I heard uh, one theologian say it this way. He said, in whichever nature you feed the most is the one that's going to become the strongest. 
Yeah, I think that's the story where you talk about a dog fight. Yeah, the dog fight. Talked about feeding one and letting the other starve. Right. And having them fight each other, which one was going to win, kind of thing. Sure. So, so it really underscores our. Uh, it really, it really should underscore our desire to be in the Word, and it's the Word that sanctifies us, right? John seventeen seventeen, right? It's the Word of God that sanctifies us. But if we only open its pages, you know periodically because we think we know what's in there then we deceive ourselves if we become too busy even doing good things we can become too busy even doing good things right uh, sometimes it can just become about the about the job or the routine you know it's kind of the way I was thinking of it when I got back from AFCO and we talked about being a Bible worker in Christiansburg mm -hmm. you know um, after going through all the training, it seemed kind of funny that you could get a job doing what everyone was supposed to be doing. <laughs> you know, which was which you're, you're, talking yeah, to people, leading them in Bible studies, and yeah. inspired to inspiring be doing people. It. Yeah, but so it's just funny that you know it could become a job position, and at that point, it would become more about trying to sustain yourself with that job right. than the job itself. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, ultimately why I thought it wouldn't have been a smart choice to take a job doing what you were supposed to be doing anyways. What should come natural to you. Yeah, yeah it should come It would defeat the purpose of, yeah. you know, when it's a job, you can just say, it's my job to study with you, as right. opposed to, I'm just giving you my time. Like, you know, that's because the Lord wants me to do this. Yeah. You know? Yeah, some real things to think about. Of course, as we continue through his story, Morneau's story there, um, he, of course, is exposing a lot of this spiritualistic activity that a lot of people put a positive spin on, and yet you're going to find out that it's actually very deadly, very deadly. You know, there's a story about, I forget who it was, but I think he was a magician who was famous for uh, being able to pass metal objects through his body. And uh, he had apparently done this act for years. And, um, you know, when being questioned about it, at some point later in his career, he had said that it was uh, these spirits that would help him perform his tricks. And one day when he was performing something where he passed the metal object through his body, it just killed him. And it was, someone was using it as an example of talking about when the spirits are done <clears throat> with you, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not pretty, and that when, when, not you, pretty when you've served your purpose and they don't care what you're doing anymore, yeah, go ahead and let them go. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. If, you, if you really want to understand uh, how significant the spiritual food is that we should partake of day in, day out, um, <clears throat> try an example in the physical realm. Try not eating regular food, physical food. Uh, a lot of people will maybe open their Bibles once a month, maybe a couple times a month, maybe once a week, you know, if they go to a, a weekly church gathering or whatever, um, they may carry the Bibles. A lot of people nowadays don't even take it with them, you know, they're willing to listen to whatever the, the speaker has to say. Uh, again, is is uh, could be very dangerous. <clears throat> you need to verify, you need to check things out according to the Word, but, but try eating just once a week. How well would that work? Not good. It wouldn't. I mean, it wouldn't work very well because you'd probably gorge yourself in that one meal because you know it was going to have to last the entire week. But but eventually your body would go into ketosis and it would it would you know lots of things would start to happen over time. Um, even though you might be able to survive uh, for a while with that kind of regimen. But it would give you a, a beautiful example of, of what happens in the spiritual. If you try spiritually eating once a week, the same considerations are going to be uh, manifested. So, uh, it's important for us to, to feast spiritually uh, on a regular basis, just like we would physically. So. Anyway, okay, <clears throat> we'll learn more about that as we go along. All right, so we're back in the book of Revelation, and uh, we're going to be looking at 
just three or four verses today. The Church of Smyrna, right? And uh, we looked last week at the Church of Ephesus, and each week we're going to be going through one of these as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we brought out last week that's important to remember, and I'll just keep reminding you of this as we go on. This is the revelation of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And Jesus Christ. But it's interesting, one of the applications that we find with the churches is that they represent periods of church history. And what was the period of church history that we looked at last week with Ephesus? The first century, right? The first century, when Ephesus meaning desirable or permitted, you know, the Roman Empire was permitting, in a sense, the, the uh, Christianity. It began to take root. Of course, you had the, the disciples and Christ himself. I mean, it was just going to happen because Christ, the Son of God, was permitted to come here and start to rectify and clarify the misnomers and the misunderstandings that the people of God, that the church at that time, who was the church at that time? During the time of Christ, who was God's church? It was the Jews. Okay, so that had been developed. I was about to say that's a pretty big question. <laughs> yeah, that had been developed. Who was actually the church, or who was yeah. said to be the church? So, God's church had been developing. Uh, well, I mean, you know, since the time of Abraham, <clears throat> but primarily during the time of Moses, the church was given an object lesson of the plan of salvation through the sanctuary service. They had been set free from the Egyptian bondage, and God was going to really spell it out for them and give them the clarity of the Passover premise, and that was the sanctuary service. And so they should have been growing and developing and, and so forth, but, but what, was, what, what happened to them? They, they developed into a routine. It became kind of same old, same old. They, they lost the significance of what was really happening through that. And so they were really had skewed off course. And so when Jesus came, when Emmanuel showed up, he was trying to pull them back onto the straight and narrow path. And uh, for that, um, they were impressed and inspired to reject him as a deceiver and a malefactor. And they ended up uh, putting him on a cross and, and crucifying him. <clears throat> so they didn't actually take his life, he forfeited his life, but, but uh, they were certainly going down that road. And you think, how in the world, how absurd could that be, that here he was their Messiah, he was the Messiah of the world, and yet they rejected him. How could that even be possible? How could a Christian, how could somebody in God's church reject the Messiah, the one who, who was going to, his mission was going to accomplish all that the sanctuary service revealed? How could they come to that place? You know, it just shows you, it's, it's a revelation of how anybody mm -hmm. could become deceived. And if it were possible, even the very elect at the end could be deceived. And uh, so we have to really take special note. So, uh, here we come down in, at John's time, a hundred years, that's, the, that's the, the, the church era, or the church period of time that Ephesus really is describing. What's the next section? The next section is uh, Smyrna. What period of time does that um, designate? Did anybody take the time to kind of look that up? Again, there's a theory out there. There's an application out there that is relevant, that each of these churches represent a period of church history. Um, there's also a theory out there that's relevant, an application, that that applies to you personally. You know, you have an Ephesus experience when you're converted. And then you go into a Smyrna experience. And then you go into a Pergamus experience, okay? So that, that happens to you in your personal walk with the Lord, as well as the church collectively. So you can see how all that ties together. But there's a problem. Now, what do you think the problem can be 
if we have those relevant applications, what could potentially become a problem in considering the ultimate fulfillment of what these churches really mean? A problem? Yeah, what could be the, uh, the potential problem? That you would stop looking for appropriate signs? We would focus more on the applications than on the ultimate fulfillment. Okay? And that has been, what, I, that's, what I've recognized is that's been where many church organizations have gone. We say that the book is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, of the Messiah, the Son of God, and yet the focus becomes on what this group did over here and what this group did there, or here in history, and what this group did here in history. And that becomes the focus. Right? And, and in fact, I had a study here that I didn't bring it with me today. But I had a study that you could, you know, a Revelation seminar study, you could go through, and that became the whole focus of the study. This church represented this period of time, and this is what happened in this period of time. How is that a revelation of Jesus Christ? Okay? It is, in one sense, that you know Jesus is in the midst of the churches. He's, in fact, it says he's walking in the midst of the churches. So he's going through that history at the same time with his people. But what's the ultimate? Remember, we're looking for, and what's relevant today, 2,000 years after this fact, is the ultimate fulfillment. That's the thing that we have to focus on today, the ultimate fulfillments not the applications so much. The applications, it's important to understand them. Uh, it's important to recognize them. They're legitimate. But the ultimate fulfillment is the important thing. But I find most people focusing on the application. Focusing on other people, other time, and not on what Messiah is trying to accomplish in his people at the end of time. Okay? So... <clears throat> Um, let's uh, <clears throat> let's go through and read these couple of verses here, and then we'll come back and unpack them a little bit. Now, in my Bible here, and maybe in yours too, you, sh you, you have uh, a lot of times they have these these uh, uh, headings. They have these headings, like for example, uh, in Revelation here it says introduction, benediction, and it goes through. The, and it says greeting to the seven churches, and this is vision of the Son of Man. And when you come to chapter 2, it says the loveless church. And when we get to uh, Smyrna, it says the persecuted church. And it just goes through the, uh, that way as kind of a heading at the beginning of each church. Now, your Bible may say the same thing or it may not say anything. But why did, why did uh, last week, why, did, why does my heading say the loveless church for Ephesus? Why does it start that way? Because they because lost they, their first love. Because they lost their first love. That was the main consideration <laughs> for that church. And what was the remedy for that? What was the remedy that we talked about? Three R's. Repent, return. Remember, repent, and return. Okay? So remember. So you did remember because you were <laughs> going through that there. So remember, repent, and return. So that, that becomes the message <clears throat> then for who? For us. For us today. You see, that's how that is, that is relevant for us today. Remember, repent, and return. That's for us. Okay? Now, we just read that, that chapter on, on spiritualism and how um, integrated spiritualism is in our society today. And, and you know what? We, we're, we are just touching the surface of how integrated that is. It is permeated in every aspect of society. Um, it just it would blow your mind to to really understand. In fact, it, it's so prevalent that what does the Bible say in the Book of Revelation? As we read further in, in, in the Book of Revelation, it's going to say that all of the world wandered, wandered, not wandered, <laughs> wandered after and wandered. I wasn't correct. Again, but a lot of people say wandered. Which sounds like it might be right, but it's actually wondered. Which wondered. Is All the world wondered after the beast, the beast system. Okay. Dan says it behooves us to, by his grace, apply the concepts to our personal lives and walk in the truth he's given us. Yeah, I mean, it not only behooves us, but we better, we better take it very seriously. 
we better take that very seriously. <clears throat> All right, so, so as Christianity is given, uh, as Christ is here and he moves the church back toward that straight and narrow path, and the disciples uh, establish that foundation, right, for that particular uh, premise. As we as we begin to as that begins to develop, is the devil just going to sit back and say, "Well, okay, you know, I tried my best. You know, I guess it's all over with for me." You know, in fact, yeah. What does the Bible say? You know, his works were defeated at the cross. So I might as well take a vacation and go to Tahiti and, and, and sit back on the beach and sip lemonade. And at this point, it's just about causing as much damage as he can before he's taken out. All right, so what began to develop? What began to develop in that first century under the Church of Pergamos that's described as being desirable or permitted? What began to happen? What was the response to, the, to this, this new... Remember, uh, Ephesus was called the City of Change. Why was he called the city of change? Because for a thousand years, they were wrapped up in paganism. They were Baal worshippers and sun worshippers, and, and they had the Temple of Diana, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. And so, so it became the city of change. Why? Because of Christianity, this new thinking, this new philosophy. I mean, it was even more than philosophy. It was a, a total life change, right? Total religious. A total, I mean, a conversion. Yeah. I mean, the city was being converted, right? So the devil's going to just sit back and say, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Oh, no. No, he, his, it, it's, like, it's like the hair's going to stand up on the back of his oh, neck. Yeah, the and whole he's, great is Diana at the Ephesians thing. <laughs> right. I don't think that was him just standing back, letting it happen. <laughs> All right, so so what happens, what typically happens, what kind of resistance begins begins to develop? Uh, do people come and just say, well, you know, you're entitled to your own opinion. Violent resistance. Okay, there's violence. Okay, instead of, instead of him acting like a serpent, he's now acting like a... Dragon. dragon. Okay, a dragon is a persecuting power. So persecution began to develop even in this, in this first century. Because so, he deceived them into sin, he would force them into. Yeah, when you no violence. longer can deceive, you have no choice. If you if you if you're the enemy, you have no choice but to take uh, stronger measures and actually try to force people to to relent, to subdue them, to to eliminate them. Yeah. Exactly okay. like what's happening today. Yes, it's exactly, exactly like what's happening Mind today. Mind control. Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. And see, that's an important concept that we're gonna we're gonna mm -hmm. discover. That's a very important concept. Yeah, it's like the word says that if Christ be lifted up, he would draw all men unto himself. Right. Which it, means that, you know, art like Christ is so convincing, mm -hmm. you know, that for the devil to convince people otherwise, he would have to pressure them into mm -hmm. going a different way. Right. In other words, you cannot stand against truth. So as truth is lifted up, as truth is exalted, as truth is clarified and exposed more fully, the light dispels the darkness. Okay. And, and the fact, only way to fight that is through the light, violence. The light dispels the darkness. So the only option you have is to try to literally force people mm -hmm. against their will, against their conscience. Mm -hmm. All right. So this began to happen. In fact, so much so that by 70 A.D., what was Rome's response to the ch God's church even in 70 A.D. during the time of Ephesus? What happened in 70 A.D.? Jerusalem. They marched over and Jerusalem was destroyed. Okay. I mean, it was still considered that at that point, at that time, the Jews, the first, the first 250,000 converts to Christianity were Jews. Right? Uh, this, this Christianity wasn't a, a Jewish... Uh, a Jewish thing, it was it was a Christian thing. Okay, it was, it was a <clears throat> a pagan or a Christian. You know, it, it wasn't uh, Jew or Gentile. It had nothing to really do with it. But Jerusalem was destroyed. Okay, so after things settled down, and of course the priesthood was also uh, eliminated at the same time. Uh, and so, for all intents and purposes, it would almost seem like this was a death blow to Christianity. You know, we're talking 40 years roughly after Messiah is here, 
and and really the uh, Christian Christianity is established, and so. Well, it would seem more like a death blow to Judaism. Well, it could be uh, interpreted that way, but more so, it was a de it could be looked at as a death blow to Christianity because the Christian dispensation or period or, or realm had had really begun in the first century there. So, but but it. It, it failed to accomplish that death blow. And why was that? Why do you think it just... Why, why, didn't Christ, why wasn't Christianity just snuffed? Because you always have your faithful few. There's always a remnant? There's, there's always a remnant, and there are people that are passionate. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're converted... In fact, the Bible tells us that if you are a Christian, you shall suffer... Persecution. Persecution. Yes. Okay. That's just going to come with the territory. In fact, you should just expect that that kind of resistance. Mm -hmm. So the world that, hated me, and they'll hate you too. And the world hated me, and it will hate you. And that hatred will 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 progress from serpentism to dragonism. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just going to become something that becomes uh, ferocious. Right. Uh, Satan is ever intent on stamping out the truth. And he's going to use anybody and everybody he can to accomplish that purpose. And, and right now, we, 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 we sit here in relative ease and comfort and whatnot, but there's a war. There's a war that's taking place, right? And we're soldiers in that warfare. And of course, we're told, you know, you gotta, you gotta put on armor. I mean, you put on armor to go to war. You don't put on armor to, to go have a picnic, you know. Take or take a sword. Right. Okay. So we got this thing going, but it's not until we get to Smyrna. It's not until we get this to the second church that this persecution takes on a greater, even a greater. Uh, aspect. Let's, let's go ahead and just read. Maybe we can have somebody read those couple of verses. We're just looking at verses 8 to 11. Let's go ahead and somebody read those verses for us. <coughs> this is the persecuted church. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay. It's interesting that out of all the churches that are listed here that we're going to go through, this is the shortest commentary of all of them. Three verses. Right? Three verses. And in the period of time that supposedly this is applicable to is a period of about 250 years, from 100 A.D. to about 350 A.D. Right? Dan says it is light that will dispel the darkness. Absolutely, absolutely. Does he actually say it in 10 days or 10 years? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, so let's go back and start to unpack these verses here. And we're just <coughs> going to take them uh, verse by verse, right? which is uh, the thing that we should be doing. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, uh, the angel, the messenger, who... Can we know who this message is really going to? Um, we got a, a neat little book here called Unfolding the Revelation by Roy Allen Anderson, and this, this thing is literally falling apart. Um, I've read through it a number of times. Um, and he brings out some really interesting things here, um, particularly on the book of uh, Smyrna here. And so as we go through this, uh, as we go through these verses, I'm going to share some things out of this particular book. All right? It's up, huh? I'm going to be reading so you can't sit with me just now, okay? These talk about the church, you know, having a, a revival or a, is that says that was dead and is alive. Yeah. 
That's important. The revival. Yeah, every to... every word that we read in, in course scripture is relevant uh, and worth digging into, worth digging below the surface. Now, if you are familiar with history at all, there was a particular person that was uh, highlighted during this period of church history. Uh, Tertullian, now these, these guys are theologians and historians, but Tertullian and Arrhenius, Eusebius, Jerome, these are all historians and theologians that have, of course many of them lived back uh, many centuries ago, and they talk about even individuals that were uh, significant in some of these places. How many of you have ever heard of Polycarp? Uh, Anybody? Polycarp? Bishop. Bishop Polycarp? Bishop Polycarp was martyred in 168 AD. And according to these guys here, John himself designated him as the bishop or the pastor, if you will, of the church of Smyrna. Okay? Of the church of Smyrna. So he would have been like the pastor. They're like, for, for example, John designated uh, Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus. Okay? John himself was the pastor of Ephesus, you know, the first church there. And then when he got older, you know, Timothy took his place according to, uh, according to history. So we have a little insight into uh, even some of the people that were involved, the, the people that were dedicated and faithful. Now, according to Tertullian and Irenaeus and these guys, uh, the state required Polycarp to worship who? Who was the state at that time? Rome. Rome. Rome was the state. Now, who? Rome, the Ra Rome, of course, had been instrumental for a hundred years, more or more, in trying to. They, they they were really apprehensive about Christianity. Okay. Um, by the time the first century comes along, and they see this thing really taking hold, and they see the fact that we can't. We couldn't get rid of it. For you know, we couldn't get rid of it back there, during the, the time when the, the, the apostles and disciples were around. Now this kind of second generation is moving in, and and people are still committed, etc. We got to we got to stamp this stuff out. And of course, this is why Polycarp. This is why they they went to these pastors and said, "Your your church is under state authority. Your church is under state control." And what do you think their response would be? We ought to obey God rather than... Okay, I mean, it's important to to follow... It's, it's absolutely important and essential to follow state authority and regulations. True? Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. Until... Until it, until it violates God. the Word of God. Until it oversteps its bounds and, and, and comes against conscience following the, the word of God. Okay? So Polycarp had a decision to make. He could follow the state. The state was demanding him to take his congregation in the worship of Caesar. Now, that's just not going to fly if you're a Christian. right? Who's the only one that you can worship? Who's the only one the Bible says you can worship? God. God. Okay? And in fact, Christ himself, when he was here as a man, he said, you, you, you know, you only worship my father, you know, God. So Polycarp was not going to go along with that. He wasn't going to encourage his congregation to go along with that. And so it cost him his life. He was burned at the stake, 168 A.D. Um, um, Smyrna has an elevation of about 600 feet in the center. <coughs> uh, in the center of Pergus is Mount Pegasus, right? And on Mount Pegasus, he was burned on the hillside of Mount Pegasus in 168 B.C. Okay, now, you would think that's going to that's gonna create a death blow to Christianity. To some Christians, it would. Okay. You would think that all this persecution is going to create... To the Romans and the Jews, they thought that it was. Yeah, we're going to stamp it out, right? Yeah. But actually, what takes place? Resurgence. People resist. When somebody gets pushed, your, your, net, your nature is yeah. to push back. And particularly if you real, recognize what's at stake. Right. What does what it say? I mean, what's at stake when somebody holds a gun to your head, you know, meaning, meaning that you know, that you're threatening your life, 
whether it's by the stake or whatever it is, <clears throat> uh, worship, you have a choice, worship God or worship something else. It doesn't even matter what it is. It's eternal life. Yes, if you have that perspective, if you have that perspective that we're dealing with something eternal here, then what is the obvious choice that you're going to make? Go with God. You're going to go with God. You're going to go with each Put a little other. extra gasoline on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let her right on in. All right. All right, so he's the, he's, the, he's the angel. He's the messenger of the church in, in Smyrna. That, uh, and so Smyrna has somebody at the helm that's committing, that's faithful, that's, mm -hmm. that's willing, that, that understands the real issues here. Right? And, uh, and so this church is really in good hands. Even though it's it's gonna gonna suffer uh, horrendously. In fact, in these three verses that we've read, this is the only church out of the seven that are listed here. There's no condemnation. There's no reproof. Right? There's no reproof given to this church. Right? And it's because of this foundation that they were that they were on, and thanks primarily, I think, to people like Polycarp. Now obviously there were others that aren't mentioned, primarily because of him. These things, let's look at the next verse. These things saith the first and the last, he who was dead and came to life. Now, you'll recognize that as we go through each of these churches, right after the introduction, you find a description. Oh, the one who's sending this message to you is... Me. Is me. And you find a characteristic given, just like in the... What's, what was the characteristic given in Ephesus? I'm the one holding the seven stars. I'm the one walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. That was in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. That was important because that was the beginning. That was your foundation. That was your foundation. Was the first one, he was saying, I'm with you. I am with you. I'm right there. I'm, whole, I'm in total control. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got, got this. I've got this. You know, and that, that's what the foundation is built on. But the second one, Ooh. he's saying, I was living, I'm dead and was, was, am alive, and was dead and am alive. I'm dead so that's encouraging alive. to those that are facing a yeah. death penalty. Facing a death. This whole, yeah, that's exactly why he's bringing out these characters. He says the There's first and the last, meaning I know the end from the beginning. I was here at the foundation of right. the world, and I'll be here at the end. So this is comforting that... I've, I've, I know this all the way through. I know He's highlighting happening. the eternal perspective. He's highlighting there that. is life after death. There is life. no matter what you're facing, no matter what happens to you, this this church is really going to be persecuted. He's promising them, you know. And it you says ten days will, wouldn't that have been ten years? You will live on. Okay. Now, let me uh, just drop drop back it's here. It says. It says his martyrdom as well as his bitter experiences through which the Sumerian church was passing could well symbolize that entire period of church history. Christians throughout the empire were compelled compelled during this time to meet in secret. I mean, it had gone to the point where they, they couldn't even openly... This was the catacombs come, come time together. when they were meeting in the, exactly. in the tunnels under the city where the burial vaults had been. I mean... To be a Christian at this period of history meant that you were your life was at risk. Well, and this is yeah. an example exactly of what we're going to be going into. Yes. And what we're going to yeah. be facing. That yeah. even meeting in a home is not going to be safe. Yeah. We talked about this mm -hmm. weeks ago. Yes. Right? <clears throat> what the seven churches are. The reason why there are seven, even though there are more congregations in that Asia Minor area, there's a reason why only seven are highlighted. Okay, mm -hmm. what was the reason? And then it's going to happen in end time. It's a number it, of it, it was to create the six to one ratio. Okay, the six to one ratio that is what the plan of salvation is built on. That's the foundation of the plan of salvation. And so you have 25, 30 examples in Scripture. What's the first six to one ratio that you find in the Bible? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Six days of labor, Sabbath rest. Okay. It's, it's absolutely critical for people uh, to understand the reason for this six to one ratio. But it's playing out here. And we'll, we'll, we'll explain more of that as we go through our, our time in the book of Revelation. But 
that six to one ratio is also something that's relevant at the end of time. Right? At the end of time, what we will discover as we go through all of these is that all the first six churches, all the characteristic of the first six churches are combined in the last one. Mm -hmm. All of them mm -hmm. are combined in the last one. Did Laodicea lose their first love? Yes. Absolutely. Is Laodicea going to be persecuted? Yes. Absolutely. And we're going to, we're going to find out that every characteristic of these first six churches are rolled up right into this last church. Okay? And so you'll just see that as we go along. All right? But these people, uh, it says here, this second period of church history extended from, from about the end of the first century to the time of Constantine or shortly thereafter, uh, about 100 to 350 A.D. Christ had no harsh words. He had no words of censure for this church. He knew where they lived and how they labored. Among them were some, of course, uh, we'll get into that verse later, but so, so he, he knows what they're going to go through, and he's going to encourage them. Many of them will face death. Many of them will be martyred, and so he's going to reassure them, hey, I was dead, and now I'm alive. You must be willing to give your life, and I promise that it will not be in vain. Okay? What, what does martyrdom, does God ever call people to something extreme like that for no purpose at all? No. Why would he allow something like people to be martyred? Why would he allow it? To further spread his word and message? Well, Except see, death, is the, death is the ultimate, ultimate. experience that, that people fear. fear. And when you have a group of people that are fearlessly facing the most fearful mm -hmm. of experiences, there's some power in that. There's extreme power in that. Mm -hmm. extreme well, power and we know that death is just a temporary sleep. It's attention right. for those that are truly in Christ. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a temporary thing. Yeah. But God will use that, as Rose is saying here, God will use that to impress, to reach others yes. that ordinarily, I mean, when you are that committed yes, to a cause that you would lay down your life for it, People take note of that. People will take note of that. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, you know, if, um, if what you believe is worth putting your life down for, then it will definitely... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reason persecution happens in other places all over the world, I think. Yeah, yeah it has to be. There's no other good reason for, for God to allow somebody yeah. that's doing a work for him to be killed or put to death or, you know... Well, it goes back to the story that I shared on uh, maybe several months back about the guys uh, in South, um, actually it was in South America, I think, where the, the jeep, the, the, two, the two missionary workers in the jeep, mm -hmm. when the old man was hacked to pieces in front of the younger guy, and then the younger guy came out and just, he was, he was asked to do the same, you know, throw your Bible in the mud and stomp on it and all that. He was committed. He recognized, okay, I'm gonna, my, I'm gonna, my life is gonna end right here, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, unso I'm gonna do an unselfish act before that time. So, so look, this jacket is brand new. He takes, it, here, this is brand new. Please don't get this, don't hack this to pieces, don't ruin it. Here, you take it. It's a gift. The guy walks away saying, we can't fight this. We can, we just can't fight that, you know. And that's what it is when somebody, when somebody is willing to to yield their life for a cause. That cause is greater than anything in their lives, even their life itself. That is the same kind of commitment that those at the end will have to display. The same thing at the very end. That's what Jesus did. He laid his life there. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was willing to do that. It says here, this is, uh, we brought out last week, this is this phrase here, I know your works. That's uh, in every... If he's in the midst of the seven candlesticks walking around, he knows what's going on. Uh, this is in every church here, this phrase, I know your works. Tribulation, that's going to come as part of the package deal, being Christian. And poverty, right? I know your, your, I know your poverty. Uh, a lot of people that, that are drawn to the gospel and the promises that it affords, um, are not people that have means 
and they're not well-to-do, they don't have, you know, the, the education a lot of times, they don't have the riches, they don't have the societal status, you know, they don't have important jobs and none of that kind of stuff. They're drawn to this, right, to, to the gospel message. Why do you think? I mean, is it just because they don't have anything in this world? They're saying, is it because they say there's got to be something better? And, that could be part of it. Yeah. I mean, when you got nothing tying you to the earth, you know, there's the, there's the sacrifices you have to give. I mean, there's no telling what they would do if you gave them a million dollars and then just watched what they did with it next year and asked them, you know, about their faith the next year, what would happen. But, yeah. What happens to people that, in fact, why does the Bible make the comment that it will be very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because your riches will be your focus instead of that. Okay. Be too worried about how you keep it. Not only your focus, but what? Obsession. Your God. It you you it trust. Places. Yeah, your God. You trust mm -hmm. in yeah. your things. Yeah. The Bible says, well, you trust in trust. their riches. Yeah, and that's why right. Christ and, and God used a lot of the lower class, I will say. You know, not your upper echelon, educated, wealthy people. Because it substantiated his true working of his miracles him working through them and doing them mm -hmm. instead of someone, oh, well, yeah, you knew this, you knew how to do this. No, they didn't. It was truly a miracle of God working. Yeah. That's right. Uh, why, do, why do you have a multitude of people that go down the broad road, particularly at the easy. end of time? It's easy. It's less stress. Not only is it... You don't have to becomes, watch you don't, Exactly. It becomes easy yeah. because of and the, you don't have the peer pressure. And the right? masses are going there. It's harder it's to be... Yeah. It's harder to be different than it is to be one of many. You feel secure. Yeah. You feel secure. Well, it's a false security. It's a really false security in the numbers. In the numbers. Yeah. Safety in numbers, yeah. right? Yeah. And people, human nature is mm -hmm. safety in numbers. If I have a big bank account, if I have an important job, mm -hmm. and I have the authority and power and money, yeah. status. You know, I, I'm secure and all that, right? Well, and that's you're looking at numbers of the world, not numbers of heaven. Yes, one and with God exactly. is, is the majority. Everything. One with God is the majority. Right. Isabel said, right on, right on. One with God is the majority. All right, so. Okay, so they're, they're poor from a worldly standpoint. Exactly. They live humble lives in a, in a, from a worldly standpoint. But it says they're rich. How are they rich? What are their riches? What are their rich toward God? Rich in faith? Rich toward God? I mean, if we're, if we're talking about enduring tribulation, then I would say it's rich in faith. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it requires trust to go through an yeah. experience like that and know that you're going to come out okay on the other side. Exactly, exactly. In fact, that's an essential. Mm -hmm. uh, rich in faith, in love, in service, in hope, in devotion, in study. Mm -hmm. Rich in perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, rich list in knowledge can go of on the truth. And on and mm -hmm. knowledge of the truth. It can just go on and on and on. That's and that's sharing. the true riches, right? Mm -hmm. That's the true riches. In fact, he's got, he has a statement here. He says, it is possible, it is possible to be rich, a rich poor man, or a poor rich man. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, you almost could feel sorry yeah. for somebody that has their faith and security and perspective wrapped up in their bank account or their mm -hmm. job status, you know. I mean, you can almost feel sorry for them. Because what do they really have? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Okay? I ain't got enough yeah. to be wrapped up in my bank. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there's something in there? <laughs> <laughs> True wealth is enrichment of character, not possessions of goods or services, goods or gold. If you're none of those things which thou shalt suffer, it says here, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried or tested. Um, he tells him flat out in this little commentary, these couple of verses here, this is going to get bad. Mm -hmm. okay. 
What are God's people told in our generation? Okay. What are God's people? What are we told? It's going to get worse. It's going to get bad. It's going to get bad. Do you, but do you hear the do you hear the church typically telling people that? No. Informing. Love people? Jesus and everything's fine. Right. In fact, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Jesus loves you, so you don't have to worry. A couple of years ago, I'd gone to a church. I guess it was a maybe a Baptist church or something like that with a couple of friends, and. Um, they were talking about this baptism they were going to be doing for this younger girl. And, well, actually, they were baptizing her, none of them remembering it. But they, um, as the pastor was getting ready to baptize her, he said, uh, he used the, the wording, uh, even though the Lord probably won't come in her lifetime, and then went on to talk about something else. And I thought that was so odd that he would speak so firmly about that declaration that the Lord's probably not coming in your life. And this was a young girl, maybe younger than 13. Right. And he's telling her, the Lord's not coming in your time. And then just went on to explain whatever else. And then he baptized her. And I'm like, you know, you want to baptize a new Christian in, into the faith with the discouragement that you're going to live on this miserable planet for <laughs> your whole life and have no hope of him coming in your lifetime? Like, But, uh, but that's the perspective yeah. that they're taking now is that he's not coming, so there's no urgency. Mm -hmm. right. If not soon, then when? You know, like... How do you hold on to any hope right. not thinking he's coming? And we know not. Only God knows when he's coming. Mm -hmm. you know, even yeah. the angels don't know. But what a sad declaration Yes. to be, to be baptized with, with that understanding. See, all the more reason to understand the blueprint. Not only false hope, but no hope. Yeah. All the more reason to understand the blueprint based on the 6 to 1 ratio. Yeah. And understand that God will cut it short. That gives you that creates urgency. Yeah. Well, I if think you even, understand the blueprint, that creates the urgency. Well, I think even without the blueprint, just understanding the signs given in Revelation and the image of Daniel should give you the sense that wow, we're so close we're to the, the end of time. We've been uh, in the toes. It could be tomorrow. For like fifteen hundred years, we've been in the toes. Yeah. So I mean, you, it could be any minute. It could be any minute. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there the, are the certain things time. that still need to be fulfilled. Because it says these things shall come to pass. But if you're truly watching, they're being fulfilled quickly. I mean, you look at the earth, it's falling apart now. But yeah. that's besides the point. The point was that he's, it was just, it's just sad that that's the perspective mm -hmm. so many other groups are taking. Yeah. Um, Which is exactly what Satan wants you to understand. Jesus says here, I know the blasphemy. Oh, sorry. He said, I know the blasphemy of uh, those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue. They're, they're in the congregation of Satan. Mm -hmm. Who's he talking about? Ain't that what Rose was talking about? The yeah. congregation of Satan there? Yeah. <laughs> but, but these were, these obviously uh, were descendants of Abraham. These are the ones right. that are claiming, but not proclaiming. <laughs> yes. Does excellent. That That's excellent. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's good. Um, these may have been descendants of Abraham by natural birth. But that is no guarantee. It's like the once saved, always saved. Once saved, all. That's no guarantee of salvation, is it? You're baptized, hey, you're then that you're all the time. No dude. guarantee yeah, no that, that because church. you were descendant of Abraham, yeah. right? Um, Jesus says, uh, you know, that he wants, uh, he, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all oh. should come to repentance, mm -hmm. right? Um, doesn't matter whether you're Abraham's seed or not. <clears throat> in fact, Paul says he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. This is Romans 2 and Romans 9. If ye be Christ, then ye be Abraham's seed. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the important consideration. It's, it's whether or not you've are converted, mm -hmm. whether you've given your heart to the Lord, and that spirit has been <clears throat> provided for you and planted in you. Okay. Isn't that a day conversion? <clears throat> it really is. I mean, the process of sanctification is what you're talking about there, and that, that is a, a daily molding and making after the will of God. The, the process where you make that decision is what they call justification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where where you recognize whether you're 
of the lineage of Abraham or whether you're a Gentile or whatever you might be, or however, whatever natural line you come down, you come to the realization that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and there's only one. There's only one door that you can open. Right? Only one door. Not even it's not Buddha. It's not Christian. It's not Muhammad. It's not a hundred thousand other, all the other 30,000 religions that are out there. There's only one door. There was one door in the side of the boat that, that uh, afforded salvation. Okay? So that's why he's saying, he's saying uh, there are many, I'm sure, that are descendants of Abraham and they're, they're, they're not, uh, they've not been converted. They're really, they're really, we're going to be working against you. Who, who becomes the greatest enemy of God's people, particularly in the last days? Here, here as well, but in the last days, who becomes the greatest enemy? Our own people. Believers. Okay. Yeah. I'll just I mean, put, a, I'll just put a little asterisk next to the fact that that actually self is the, your greatest enemy. Okay, trusting in self. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, stepping away from that, other brothers and sisters could become your greatest mm -hmm. enemy. Yeah, your closest family, relatives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's going to be so important to pray. And so we need to really be praying for one another, okay, in that regard. And, and of course, studying to show ourselves approved unto God. Yeah. Work when they do not be ashamed. And so when it's talking, though, is it in verse 9 there, is it mostly referring to, like, uh, I'll use the term, like, pretend? Christians, like people who are among them who do not withstand the persecution? Well, you know, if somebody, if somebody came, if one of the authorities came to your house and they said, you know, yeah, you know, this, uh, you guys, you guys, are you a Christian? Well, you know, well, not well, you know, so, so, but, you know, we know that you're a descendant, we know that you're Jewish and what kind of thing, and, 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 and then you could snitch on your neighbor. You could say, well, my neighbor, I mean, he's really a committed Christian, even though he's Jewish, too. I mean, you could be a Jew as well, but you could, you could be end up... Be an agent of the devil. Be, yeah. Becoming an agent to the state authorities or whatever, you know. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen more and more. People to save their own skin, more or less, or to be in some way... Secure themselves. World War II is a great testimony to that. Yeah, exactly. People were selling out Jews all the time. Yeah. Self becomes usually the primary thing. How can I save myself? What do I need to do to save myself? If it means, you know, throwing pointing the direct, the throwing the path, pointing the direction well, of finger at somebody else. To blame someone else. Of course. She had nature. Yeah, the so serpent which, which thou made, the you. woman which thou made. Yes. It wasn't exactly. my fault. It wasn't. Exactly. You got that going on here. And the serpent okay. didn't have anything to say. So <laughs> you got that very thing going on here. Well, and I so, stuck. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, it was. We're running out of time here. All right. So now we go into this. Don't fear. Do not fear any of those which you are about to suffer. Indeed, what does indeed mean? This is a fact. This is not speculation. This is not supposition. This is a fact when he says indeed. Right? Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested or tried and you will have tribulation ten days. Um, this period of time, uh, in fact, uh, I'll read it here. It says, uh, it says here the I was just joined by the fact that uh, a year, a uh, day represents a year. Exactly. So, uh, that's the reason I mentioned, you know, will it be 10 days or, uh, or 10 years? How important of a consideration do you think it is? for him to use the word day there instead of telling him right out flat, this is going to last for 10 years. Very important because most people would be discouraged. A short time of tribulation is easier to handle than a long time. Yeah, I can handle two weeks. Yeah, I can handle two days of pain, but... Two, two years. years. Woo! Really? Yeah. Um, and most people would be going, bring the drugs. 
It says here, um, it says during the second and third centuries, the Roman emperors tried to obliterate the church by persecution. They feared Christianity because it was making inroads into popular thought. People's lives were changing, and, and lifestyle was changing, and people were threatened by that. Um, and, you know, when, when you change, when you change in your personal life, your personal experience, did you, did you still end up with the same friends and relationships that you'd always had developed over, over years when you were unconverted? No. They started to eventually s s to say, mm -hmm. it's, it's, too, it's too much of a reminder that they're okay. doing the wrong yeah. thing. Yeah. It's too much of a reminder that they're, that they're uh, you know, they're, they're walking in sin. Mm -hmm. The and reason so, that Jesus said the world hated him was because he pointed, he brought light to the darkness. Right, so your very presence is a condemnation yes. over their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so they, they drift away, and they finally they, they break the, the relationship entirely because they can't, and light has no part with darkness. Mm -hmm. So, darkness is an absence of the So they, he says they, the Romans, they feared Christianity because it was making inroads into popular thought. They considered it a rival. They were threatened by it. The number of persecutions were, were instigated a number of persecutions were instigated, ten in all. So here's another reason for the ten days. Ten specific aspects or... or uh, ten specific persecution Ten specific periods. periods of persecution within that time frame began. But under Diocletian, Diocletian, persecution was the worst. And... And that lasted, that period lasted, there's some people that contend that that lasted 10 years, 303 to 313. Some say it started to dissipate, you know, around 309 or something like that. Um, there, there's some, con some concern, but I can imagine that there was still a residual persecution that was taking place. You know, if you go to, to Sodom and Gomorrah, the reason why we find sulfur balls there is because you had this downpour, this conflagration of sulfur being rained from the sky, and it, it turned everything pretty quickly to ash. But then you had this residual, uh, um, you know, sputtering of, of sulfur that was still falling. That's what we find. That's the, that's the only stuff that's left that we find, is the, is the tapering off. And so there, I'm sure that they're including here the little taper off. Is ten years after the solar conversion? Pardon me? Ten years. It's ten years after the, you mean for our time? No, there wouldn't be 10 years after probation closes. In fact, in, in studying the book of Daniel, that you've asked the question there, my personal conclusion is that God has given us a direct uh, indication of 45 days. And like we were just talking about, you know, if, if we could, if we had a, a specified period, 10 days, 45 days, we could count them off. And we could, we could, All right, day we could one, go, scratch we, it out. We could go through that, right? Mm -hmm. But if you had an undetermined amount of period, an open-ended period of time, uh, you know, you where it could possibly be never-ending, yeah. or you had something that was like 10 years or 20 years, mm -hmm. we would say there's no way we could survive that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, all right. things are possible. I'm not going to 10 years time to short. Get, but saying okay. if you needed to preserve us 10 years wouldn't be... You know, impossible for him, but the world would definitely be in yeah. dire straits after ten. Well, and he preserved Elijah for how many years? Or days? Forty, was it? On the one meal? Mm -hmm. Forty days? For well, Elijah, when he was speaking, the birds were bringing him the food. What about Moses? Yeah, he went, he went 40 days. Yeah, on the one meal, yeah. What about Moses on that? That's true. Okay, so this lasted 10 years, uh, 303, typically 313 is what a lot of commentaries suggest. It had to be somewhere in that time frame. Like I said, there were many emphasis of persecution by the Roman authorities at that point. It's not until Constantine comes along to the throne that you begin to see a reversal. Okay, And of course that becomes significant too. We'll talk about that uh, next time. But, um, Kenny, you were talking about the ten days being ten years, there was a precedent established during the time of Moses uh, in uh, Numbers 14:34, day for a year concept in prophetic uh, things, also repeated in Ezekiel 4:6. So this idea concerning prophecy that a day could represent a year, and 
and I think the reason that that's used is because when you are living through that real period, um, that may become very discouraging if you think you've got this, this incredible amount of time period to go through. If he'd have told him 10 years, that would have been very, very discouraging. Okay. Well, do you suppose there was any aspect of truth to the idea that, you know, because he's talking about some of you will be cast into prison and whatnot, which obviously meant like a death sentence in a lot of cases in most of these prisons. Right. Uh, if you weren't fed by somebody. Um, you know, could it also be that like it was also a literal 10 day period like uh, of testing for some people? Because I mean, you don't, you only survive for so long without food. Well, you, you could know? go 80 days with, with, uh, without food. You can, you can go, uh, <clears throat> You can go uh, eight days without water. Yeah. You can go eight minutes without air. But you can't even go eight seconds without hope. So, I mean, most of persecution is really targeted at eliminating your hope and your perspective. They, the, the, the mental torture. I was just going to say it's a mind, mind thing. It's, it's a mind thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, and of course, remember, a lot of this, uh, my, my, my perspective would be that a lot of the things that we find in the book of Revelation, particularly relevant to the ultimates, could very well be some of these literal time periods as well. You know. <clears throat> be faithful unto death, God said. It had to be very inspiring to them. Uh, and I will give you a crown crown of life. It's interesting that he brings out the crown of life, um, the skyline of the city of Smyrna from a distance represented a crown. You know, and he's saying, you know, you've got a, you know, you got a kind of a crown city. In fact, it's interesting that the city itself um, uh, was also called the city of life. That seemed kind of <laughs> uh, antithesis of what the Christians were experiencing. It was a city of death, right? But of course Christ said, I, I've died and I'm alive, so you can die and you can be alive as well. It was also, but it was also called the, the Ornament of Asia. It was called the Ornament of Asia because from a distance they had this crown, like this jeweled crown uh, from a distance it looked like. <clears throat> kind of interesting. So <clears throat> We're just about done, so I wanted to ask... There's any. I wanted to ask one other question. Um, of course, this is where it brings in the idea as well with the last verse there of the second death. Right. Right. Exactly. Which is a very clear indication of the second. You won't be hurt by the second death. So again. So what is? Hurt for this one, but not. So what's the ultimate message? We look back at Ephesus. We see the ultimate message was to remember, um, <clears throat> remember repent and return. Okay, um, what is the ultimate message that the Church of Smyrna is saying to us? Endure. The endurance would certainly be part of it. Choose <clears throat> life eternal. Choose life eternal. I, I think probably the ultimate message would be about giving one's self. I think it's 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 speaking specifically against uh, selfishness, we need to be selflessness. In other words, we need to be willing to give our lives if God chooses uh, for us that that's the best, best path for us. We need to be willing to, we, we need to be totally selfless as we approach the end of time. Okay? And just as they were being persecuted and giving of themselves. They had the perspective. Of course, that's all important. Endurance is, is important. Keeping the perspective of eternal versus temporal. That's, that's certain important considerations. But giving of oneself. What, is, what did Jesus, what was the example that he gave? Himself. I gave my life. See, all, all that's about giving of oneself. And that's going to be so important as we uh, approach the uh, peril of the last days. Um, self, in fact, self is going to have to be just completely, completely eliminated. 
Mm -hmm. that had to be, I mean, to go through what God is going to ask us to go through, mm -hmm. so there, there, there can be no trusting in self. True. Not one shred. Well, and he asks us to give, a, give our all uh -uh. to him. Right. Our all is self. Right. When Jesus comes, this is, of course, after probation closes, when he comes, what does it say in First John? We looked at this text before, beloved. <clears throat> right? Um, uh, let me just quote it here. First John chapter. First <clears throat> John three two. Beloved. Says if you lose your life, what manner of love the Father sake, and Son? For His sake. Yeah. You will save it, but if you. Uh, <clears throat> Get, uh, don't give your life for his sake, then you'll lose it. Exactly. Yeah. See, that's that's the, that's an example of total selflessness. Be, be, uh, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Right? Therefore, <clears throat> the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be as he like Him. You see. Well, we are made in His image. Made in His image, but made in His image after His likeness. And so, um, yeah, physically like there's him. a resemblance, but also spiritually now there's a resemblance. Mm -hmm. and there's a reflection. We're reflecting the very character of Jesus, which was totally selfless. Right. You see? And that's, that's, that's where, that's the message from the Church of Smyrna. That's the ultimate message for us from the church of Smyrna, mm -hmm. to, say, so to be like Christ. It's revealing Him. Christ it's really revealing Him, the characteristic of Christ. Be mm -hmm. to be like them, you know? Right. And you see, the word Smyrna, what does the word Smyrna mean? It means myrrh, myrrh which is a perfume, a sweet smell. In fact, that was the sweet smelling savor. Remember, Christ was permitted to come, and He became the myrrh, right? In His mission, He became the myrrh, the sweet smelling savor unto God because of his love for humanity, he became the myrrh. And that's what he's asking us to do, become the myrrh, you know? So that's the message for you. Okay, our time has come and gone. It's, uh, thank you for all of your, uh, your input and your questions. Time for, us to, uh, time for us to pause for just a minute and go to the Lord in prayer. So I'm going to ask you if you would Maybe bow your heads. And, well, the, uh, J.D. had shared oh, was, go ahead. just said uh, follow his example by giving our lives as well. Yes, that's that's the message right there. That's in a nutshell. So. Ken, would you like to dismiss us in prayer today? Hi, Lord, we love you and we thank you for this beautiful day that you permit us to come and worship you. We ask that you uh, guide us through life especially in the last days, we ask for a lot of help. And we pray for all who need prayer that needs to come and know you as Lord and Savior. I pray for your coming that we get this all over with. And I want you to bless everybody and let Satan go down alone. I pray that uh, uh, for the day and to guide us through life and I want to mention that uh, we uh, want you to bless the food that you provide for us each Sabbath to fellowship and we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen and amen. Okay, well thanks everybody. Thank you guys for checking in with us again this week. Hope to see you next week. Uh, same place, same time. Um, and uh, hope you have a great and wonderful and blessed week. Keep the faith. God bless.